But welcome to the Women in Sports podcast. It's episode five. And this week we're going to be speaking about rugby league, but we're going to be speaking about how the sport can be much bigger and how it can address so many issues and so many barriers, such as social change. And we're going to be talking about the documentary. It's the year anniversary of the Power Mary documentary that was made following the Papua New Guinea Orchids on their journey in the 2017 World Cup. I was really lucky to, to witness that firsthand as a player, but then also looking up last year to see the screening of Power Mary um, in Manchester at the Women's Super League launch. And today I'm, I'm really, really lucky and really, really excited to be joined by the director of the documentary, Joanna Lester. Joanna, thank you for taking time out. I know you're in a different time zone, so it's a, it's a little bit late for you. It's bright and early for us. Um, but, but how are you? And the year anniversary, it must seem like it's flown by. Yeah, it doesn't really feel like a year ago um, that we first met, actually, at that... Um at the launch of Power Mary in the UK, which was hosted by um, Rugby League World Cup and the Women's Super League in Manchester. And we did a podcast together that day, actually, um, <laughs> pretty much before we'd even met. Um, so it's nice to be doing another one now. Um, but yeah, with everything that's going on at the moment, I just keep thinking, I'm so glad we released it and did all our international screenings and stuff. Well, most of them last year, because if we were trying to do that now, we'd obviously be in a lot of trouble. So yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's been a it's been a long journey. Obviously, the World Cup was was far more than a year ago. But um, filming the World Cup, filming the follow up, sort of where are they now? Part doing all the production and then releasing different countries. Here we are in April twenty twenty, and uh, the journey continues. But the, and there's so much. There's still so much hype around it, and there's still so much that you're doing now. And and I've been obviously. I was speaking to Charlotte Booth about it in episode one of the, one of the podcasts because they were fresh off of a tour to, to Papua New Guinea. But it, it there's still so much surrounding it, and I think the fact that it's such an inspirational, emotional, raw, passionate documentary is great to talk about it in a time like now because it shows how much great there is going on in the world. And in particular for you, where you've you focused on that area of Papua New Guinea um, for quite some time, it, it's it's still great to see. Yeah, and even though it was sort of primarily about a particular World Cup that happened in a particular year, all those kind of bigger themes in it about the impact that rugby league has um, socially in Papua New Guinea and to some extent in other countries too, um, you know, they're really ongoing. And in fact, that's only increased since since the World Cup, since the film came out, since the Orchids have become established. Of course, England women going to PNG was a huge factor in raising the profile of, of women's rugby league. So um, I think that's why it's still resonating because, to be honest, sadly for me, a lot of people still haven't seen it. Um, it's very hard to publicise a, a documentary film um, just generally, really, unless you're um, an extremely famous documentary maker. So a lot of people still haven't seen it. And when they come across it, they love it. So it's still going. And I think, you know, we'll speak about it a lot more in depth and there'll be a chance for people, you, you can go and watch the, the trailer and then get a taste for it. And, and I'll ask you at the end to finish off about how people can get access to the documentary. But I loved it. And obviously I, I kind of see it as an inside perspective in, in the 2017 World Cup. Saw that, that journey that the women were on. Not, you know, saw that before we kind of saw the documentary, saw a little snippet. We, we would see bits in newspapers about, you know, some of the women speaking out about how far away them representing their country in a World Cup in Australia was from what they're used to back home. And it for me, it, it, it resonated. And then the, getting to see the documentary with you at um, Manchester was absolutely amazing. And I think about it still a lot now. And I, I'm really, really envious of the, the, I said it to Charlotte, the England girls who got to go out on tour to Papua New Guinea, because I think that's a once in a lifetime opportunity for, for anyone. But it's amazing. It's, it's amazing. And we'll cover that a little bit further on. But I just... I read somewhere that, you know, you said that the documentary, that it, you know, you never set out to write a film, but the story found you. So I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, your steps into journalism um, and then why why Pacific Nations and why, and why PNG? Yeah, well, my very first steps in journalism were via Rugby League. Um, despite my family being from Leeds, therefore a bit of a Leeds Rhinos fan, I grew up in London, therefore also a London Broncos fan. Um, so my first bits of journalism were writing about rugby league, mainly for the London Broncos match day programme, um, which um, I mean, it's great that in England, every club has a match day programme, as you might know, in Australia, none of them do. And they just have one magazine that covers everything. Um, I'm not sure if they even have that anymore. But um, yeah, so a match day programme was a great place to start writing. Um, like a lot of rugby league journalists, I also wrote a bit for League Express. 
Um, so my journalism journey did start in rugby league um, when I was about 15. Um, and um, then I did sort of lo lots of other things as well, um, sport more generally um, at the BBC in London for a bit and news as well. And um, moved to Australia. Um, the timing was deliberate to cover the 2008 World Cup. So we're a few World Cups ago now. So I moved to Australia just for the 2008 World Cup um, and just sort of covered covered that as a journalist. Um, there was a lot of uh, socialising with fellow England fans and, and other things along the way. But that was that was um, a sort of that was that was why I moved to Australia when I did. Um, like you talked to Charlotte about in your first episode, um, you know, you get here and then you decide you want to stay, um, which is not that straightforward. Um, so I think like she's planning now, I had to do um, seasonal work. Um, so I actually went to work on farms for three months to get a new visa. And then long story short, eventually I got a permanent residency and now citizenship so I can stay. Um, but I did have to quit journalism for a few months to go and work on a cattle station, which was fine because they were massive rugby league fans. Um, so we did a lot of bonding over the North Queens and Cowboys. Um, so ever since I moved to this part of the world, I was interested in the Pacific and what rugby league is like in the Pacific. I mean, the, Australia has a close relationship with the Pacific, obviously, because Pacific countries are Australia's nearest neighbours. Um, and sport, but rugby league in particular, is one of the kind of biggest areas of common ground. Um, and also there's a lot of Australian organisations involved in development in the Pacific and sort of community development. So I always sort of, and at that time, so, you know, just over 10 years ago, there were quite a few Pacific players in, well, there were maybe about 30% of NRL players were from the Pacific. Now it's more like about 50. And of course, there were loads of Pacific players in England as well. So I'd always known them and interviewed them and be interested. Um, so, but I was always interested in the potential for our ability to have a social impact in the Pacific. Um, and back in 2008, eight nine, that wasn't really happening, um, but it was sort of starting to happen or the ideas were starting to form. Um, and in 2009, I went to Papua New Guinea to cover the Pacific Cup, which was um, one of those tournaments that would have been great if it happened quite very often, but it didn't happen that often, but it happened in 2009. And it was PNG, uh, Tonga, Fiji, Cook Islands, um, and that was it, those four. Um, and so it was in PNG, and I'd always, I think like a lot of rugby league fans, I'd always wanted to go to PNG because it's the only country in the world where rugby league is a national sport. Um, it's so fascinating. We've had so many Papua New play in Super League and other levels of competition in England, and you've always heard all these stories about um, about all those players and how they sort of never left PNG. Marcus Bai, who I've since had the um, the honour of working with at the Commons, but you know you hear a lot about it. I'd always wanted to go there, and now being in Australia, it was pretty close. Um, still not that straightforward to go, um, but I went. Uh, with the ARL at the time to cover that tournament um, and it was that kind of really confirmed my feelings that there was so much potential for rugby league to have a, a really important social impact in PNG and around that tournament there was a sort of bit of um, messaging about um, violence against women and HIV and AIDS which was um, a very big issue in PNG then it's less of a big issue now because um, a lot of work has been done um, but that sort of planted the seed um, and over the next few years that this the sort of because of the growing number of Pacific players in the NRL and a kind of growing focus in Australia in working with the Pacific for better kind of community development and social impact through sport um, in 2013 the NRL um, began running a program in PNG that used the popularity of rugby league in schools and in communities um, to deliver kind of key messages, uh, it was mainly in primary schools actually, so key messages about the importance of going to school every day, um, about respectful behaviour um, and, and sort of various other health things. And so that programme was funded by the Australian government and the NRL um, had a team of Papua New Guineans who ran it. And so I moved to Papua New Guinea in 2014 for a year to be the, the first media and communications officer on that programme. Um, so they'd been running for a few months, we were doing some really good activities that really kind of had an impact with the um, mainly the, the kids, but also the communities they work with. And we wanted to tell those stories more. And when I got there, 
as I mentioned, all my colleagues from Papua New Guinea, and a lot of them are women. This program was actually um, really groundbreaking, the number of women in, employed for a rugby league program. Um, far more women working for the NRO in its Pacific offices than in Australia, actually, in terms of game development. Um, so a lot of my colleagues are female, and they all play rugby league. Um, and this was my first, um, actually, my first interaction with women's rugby league. Um, and that was sort of when I started to see that it was women's rugby league that had even more potential in the Pacific to change the way that um, people thought about women, to potentially reduce violence against women, to create more opportunities for women in leadership. Um, and that was kind of how I got involved. It's it's such a, a, cra a, crazy, a crazy journey, but I think when you say that it's the national obsession, I'd, I'd like, until you watch the footage from the documentary, or I know that um, England Women released a short film from their time over in, in Papua New Guinea, I don't think you've ever quite seen anything like it, have you? And that's probably what's the most powerful tool, that if women are involved in something that's so popular, and you use the role models like, yeah, you know, your players from the PNG come I know you're speaking about Marcus Bayer there. I think he, he was one of my favourite Leeds players growing up. So, you know, if if a Leeds fan, the, the, the guys from, from PNG are going to obviously like absolutely worship him, the fact that he's been over to Super League, played for Leeds and and, and, and a PNG representative. So what what was the, the journey after that then? So 2014 onwards, the NRL committed to having... The Papua New Guinea Orchids form a team. What was your involvement with that? How did the and how did the documentary come about? Yes, yeah, so towards the end of the the first year when I was living in PNG full time, so basically towards the end of twenty fifteen, beginning of twenty sixteen, um, we we yeah, like you say, we kind of got wind that PNG women were going to form a national team and compete in the World Cup which was a great relief to all the women who've been playing rugby league locally for 10 years in some cases. And there still hadn't been a national team and they'd never got to play for their country. There had been a lot of false dawns about when this might happen, but finally it was happening. And so to me, this was an opportunity to sort of tell this story about women's rugby league in PNG and the impact that it was having on individual women who played it, but also the, the broader community and how they think about women. Um, having the world cup as a backdrop to that story kind of gave me hope that you know we, i'd be able to get some funding to make a documentary people would pay attention etc so rather than it, then it just being a, a sort of local story it became more of an international story um obviously the fact that the world cup in australia was helpful to get australian partners on board the nrl was also one of the funding partners um the australian government in fact the u.s government was the biggest funding partner um so basically having the world cup as the sort of, I'm not going to say the end of the journey, but as a really important part of the story, um, kind of elevated it from just being what's happening locally to um, this is a much bigger impact. Um, and not only the impact that it's having on the players that you meet in the film, but the potential it has to continue doing that as Women's Rugby League grows in the region. And I think you say, you say that it's um, the end, the end journey, but it's it was actually just, I think it captured the emotion from the players, the 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 magnitude of the sort of platform that they were playing on and, and things like that because, you know, like you say, that some of the players won't have left PNG ever before. So then to go and play in a World Cup, which was all televised, and we know that social media um is a big thing within the NRL and, and for the players, but we all you also see in the documentary how you can sort of contextualise the the criticism that the women come up against and the sort of social change that you're trying to address. And do you think it's been really, really, really great for both, you know, communities worldwide, the importance of how big social media is and what that can mean to people, but also the journey of the orchids and how it went from being quite toxic and, you know, quite critical to then actually people getting behind them and being proud of, of the nation and the women and what they're doing because they could see how much it meant to them. Yeah, I think that's something that people have been able to relate to in a lot of places. Um, certainly in Australia, around the time we were releasing it, um, there was a particularly kind of newsworthy episode where there's a photo of an Australian rules player, a female player kicking, um, just showing her great athleticism, and there was a lot of um, trolling about that, which was yeah, um, a sort of a huge story at the time around the time we were releasing Palmary which obviously focuses a lot on 
um, social media feedback on um, women playing male dominated sports. So actually we got sort of quite a lot of um, interest in media coverage because of that. Um, but just generally, um, the sort of, I guess the keyboard warrior thing does resonate with a lot of people, especially women in sport, but just communities in general. Um, yeah, and that is something that has been brought up in a lot of countries. Um, and I think in PNG, the people, I, I think it has, I mean, you, the players have said to me that they have seen a lot less negativity um, more recently. Um, there's, I guess there's a few reasons for that. Um, people are getting used to the idea, obviously beat England um, to that course of the doubt is to shut up, but um, definitely the the sort of the fact that the orchids are now established here to stay have had some good results um and i think people people saw them not themselves in the documentary although in some cases they would have been themselves because all those comments were real but they saw people like them um who you know sit behind a phone making comments and actually saw the impact that has on those people yeah. whether that's in sport or not in sport and really um about that. Yeah, and I think it's a it's a particularly important message at a time that we're in now of you know we're kind of saying it's just be kind. That's that's what we need people to be and we need people to do. But you speak about the players within within those um, within the film, so I think you know it's an award winning documentary. I was I was on the Facebook page last night, and you know the the style of it. That's the award. It is, I can see it in the background. I'm, I'm loving the backdrop. Mm. But they, they, at the end of the day, what like their life has gone from kind of. Just play rugby because they love it and that will never change. They'll always love it. But to be able to document that journey, they must be so proud to be able to, you know, show if they've got children, daughters, sons, whatever. It's it's helping address that change that's needed for, you know, respect to women and inequality to women in PNG. But also, how has their life changed? Because I know I know some of the stories from talking to you, but for people tuning in, like, what what has the documentary meant for them? What has it springboarded them to go on and do yeah well all the four um players who were mostly featured in the documentary so kind of the main characters have all um gone on to do pretty amazing things since then um and even if you haven't seen it this is not going to spoil the documentary so i'm going to tell you anyway um so kathy who was the captain at the world yeah. cup the inaugural captain um she was somebody who i worked with um every day during my year um in, in png and and i guess it was her vision as a player to always see the bigger picture um you know i couldn't have made power mary if there hadn't been a, a, a sort of small number of core players who were all about the bigger picture like i was and certainly not all of the players were about the bigger picture and i wouldn't expect them to be um you know there's a lot of other considerations and a lot of other challenges they've got to overcome but kathy was was always about the bigger picture she speaks so beautifully in the film you can tell that and so she's now running the NRL program across the whole of Papua New Guinea. So the one that started in 2013 that I used to work on, which is now four, four parts of PNG with about 20 staff, um, thousands of participants. So she's sort of managing that, um, which is um, a huge role. Um, Della, who um, was the one who lived in the settlement, so lived in the sort of uh, fairly low socioeconomic suburb, you might say, um, she, kind of had to, like you had to retire from playing because of injury um unlike you there's pretty much no treatment for any kind of rugby league related injury in png so um most players based there who are sort of playing at the local level male or female um most injuries tend to be the end of their career even if it's something that could be quite easily um dealt with in england australia um so Dell had a shoulder injury so she uh, mostly stopped playing but she started coaching her club team her local team um and as since last year she's been on the orchids coaching club. staff um so she's now the, the one of the trainers for the orchids um and she was one of the players who came with me to vanuatu um in march to watch primary there and she trained the local teams there and all the players and coaches in vanuatu thought she was amazing all the male coaches in vanuatu were just hanging off della's every word as she basically taught them how to coach, and that was just an amazing thing to watch. Um, so Della is doing very well. Give me some tips. Um, and it's brilliant. And then those who are still playing um, for the Orchids, um, Amelia Cook, the one who lives in Brisbane, she captained the Orchids last year in their um, test against Fiji. 
um, and is, is doing pretty well both in her playing career and also in her day job, which is as a nurse at the moment, she's pretty busy with yeah, kind of work, um, but I check in with her often and so far it's, it's been okay in Brisbane. Um, and Gloria, who was the youngest member of the team who is still at school and during the World Cup only got to play in the last match and um, sort of found it quite difficult to, to be in the team and then have her, you know, her this the high aims that she set of herself not met by actually not really getting into the, the run on team very often. Um, she is now the vice captain of Little Kids. Um, so she is really one of the leaders now um, and not only for your kids, but she lives in Garoka, which is one of the places where England played last year. Um, very involved in coaching women's teams there, setting up new teams for girls. So really those players who play for the Orchids, which has only been, you know, probably a total of about um, less than 50 or quite a lot less, actually maybe less than 40 over the first three years. Um, they really are now sort of seen as role models in their communities even more than they were before. Um, and a lot of them are really involved in um, just growing rugby league for women and girls. And and so they should be, because just listening to you speak about their, their journey, it's just, for me as a player, I had utmost, utmost respect for them, for playing against them and playing in the, in the same tournament as them. But then to hear the journeys that they've gone on on the back of that, when they face challenges that we don't even have in the first place. So to be doing what they're doing is absolutely inspirational. And I'm, I'm glad they've all gone on to... to amazing things and their journey seems to be going brilliant and perseverance for um for the for the players now vice captain it's just absolutely amazing and i've seen some of the stuff that kathy's done i've on some things that come up on the nrl on on facebook and things like that for, for png so it, it's great and i hope della's all right with injury i'm sure we can share stories about how it's rubbish but we can express ourselves through coaching it sounds like she's doing a brilliant job so we speak about them key messages and you've spoke about the link with the, the NRL and I thought we could speak about it now because Amelia played in the the first year, the inaugural year of the women's NRL and she won it with Brisbane Broncos, didn't she? So what what's the link like with that? And, and obviously you've got an, an, a national side now, international side for PNG. What do you think is going to happen in terms of is there ever going to be a, you know, a PNG Hunters for the, for the women? Is there going to be... You know, I've, I've heard rumours is Elsie Albert playing in the NRL. What What's the pathway for women now as both domestic as well as international rugby? Yes, great question. Um, I certainly hope there will be, as you put it, a PNG Hunters for the women. Um, I certainly think there's a good chance we'll see a PNG team in the women's NRL before we see a PNG team in the men's NRL. Um, you know, things have moved so fast with women's sport. Um the women's NRL will be expanding at some point soon. There's obviously a huge playing base in PNG um, and a number of Orchids players who are based in Australia already. Um, in the documentary, we only had Amelia, really, but now there's, um, I think last year, maybe maybe about six um, Australia-based Orchids players, one of whom actually discovered the Orchids through watching Power Mary at a screening that I went to, and then a few months later, she was playing Chris. Um, she was really lovely. Um, so... So there's, there's a lot of players, basically. Um, some of them are in Australia, most of them are in PNG. Um, but people are starting to think more about pathways. You mentioned Elsie Albert, who was um, absolutely one of the star players for Orchids last year. She, um, like Charlotte Booth, moved to Brisbane this year um, to play in the new Women's Queensland statewide competition. Um, she was basically signed by the coach of South Logan Magpies, um, which is also the team that three other Orchids, including Amelia, play for. Um, but he'd seen her play against England and against Fiji last year, and he wanted to sign her. So she became the first PNG female player to move to Australia for a playing wow. project, um, which was huge. Unfortunately, as you spoke to Charlotte about at length, that competition lasted one round and um, has now had to be cancelled because of coronavirus. Um, Elsie's still here at the moment, I think. She's actually staying with one of the other players and her family, so there's a good PNG set up there. Um, but I know that she is planning to um, either stay or come back next year. And as you say, I think I have no inside knowledge, but I think she, NRL clubs will definitely be looking at her regardless of the Queensland competition not happening, just based on what they saw of her last year um, for the NRL women's competition. We don't know yet at this point what's happening with that, but given that it looks hopefully like the NRL men's will be resuming by mid-year, 
um, there's now a lot of optimism that the women's competition will be happening around when it should have done, which would have been about August, September. Yeah, it's, it, there's so much uncertainty, isn't it? But again, come back to the fact of the positive stuff is the, the, these women are, are creating a... The, the, they're just the trail the trailblazers out there they are the first to do all these things and and should be so proud and i guess obviously you've got you've got the nrl and the links with them and i was reading that um on the shirts of the prime minister's cup for quite a few years they've they've had you know key social change messages such as strong strong men respect women and and trying to get that because that's the biggest barrier that that the women of png face is that you know they're kind of treated second best and there's a lot of domestic violence and stuff like that so co combined with the links within rl the great work that you've done with the documentary and also just you know the great work that the women have done themselves by just being just constantly doing what they're doing because they love it and because the, the strong independent women that are going to do it because they see the bigger picture like you spoke about kathy she sees the bigger picture that if she can step out first there's going to be a long year and you hear her say it in the in the film you know young girls will will play this game they will follow us and and to me that was absolutely amazing how how big has the change from sort of 2017 to now been of of the the people's you know reactions and and thoughts towards it, women playing sport playing rugby well um apparently in the year after the world cup um so i think it was 2018 the number of women as in adult women playing rugby in png tripled wow. So only immediate, basically immediately afterwards, um, because I think you know it's su obviously such a popular sport. Most people spend all their weekends watching it. Um, all their brothers, uncles, etc., have played it. Maybe they just sort of didn't really realise that they could, and then all of a sudden they saw it um, on TV and realised they could. Um, in PNG, there's a lot of um, different competitions around the country, um, so. It's, um huge country most places they're not connected by road you have to fly or walk between them like you often hear stories about um rugby league players so justin olam for example who's currently in melbourne storm he used to have to walk for hours to go to another village for to find a tv to watch um nrl and now people from his village do that to watch him um so it's a very spread out country but rugby league is everywhere um and in recent years it's actually been um compulsory for the local leagues to have a women's competition. Um, so that's also really contributed to the growth of the number of women's teams um, and the opportunities for um, adult female players. But I think it's also worth talking about girls as well. Um, so what used to be the school, the school boys competition is now um, has school girls as well. So it's been renamed the national schools competition. Um, the NRL is quite involved in um, what in Australia it's called mini mod so the kind of six to twelve year olds version of rugby league um and getting more primary schools kids involved in that um which is um equal girls and boys um so there's a lot more activity happening with school girls as well um and some of that was a direct result of the world cup and 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 the momentum's just sort of been building since then it's 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 crazy and I was just thinking then when you just speak about all those things and the journey, the journey that the women have gone on, and then you're saying that the, there's these new girls who are starting that journey of they already love rugby league, but they now see it as an option that they can play. And looking up to the players, you know, like Amelia and and, and the girls involved, Elsie, they've gone to Australia to a World Cup, and then they've had Australia come, England have come and played, and then you know the opportunity that they're going they're going to go to England to a World Cup, and you know this is it's life changing for them and and just absolutely amazing so to have such a great infrastructure that's given these girls an opportunity I always openly say that that rugby league has changed my life and given me the opportunity to go to places like New Zealand Australia and and and, and Brazil and I'm I'm so lucky for that and you know it's just absolutely amazing that the way that you can use it as a tool to to do so much more but you know, looking looking towards the World Cup in 2021, how are the girls prepared? How are, how are the girls prepping? Is the excitement building? It's it's not far far out now at all, is it? Yeah, lots of excitement. Um, also excitement about the fact that this time, obviously, they'll be preparing a lot further in advance. Um, yeah. As anyone who's watched the documentary knows, it was a bit last minute last it, time. How, how long um, was it? Three months? Two months? Uh, yeah, about three, three months. months. Um, the team was picked in August. They played the Gillaroos 
in the Prime Minister's 13 in yeah. September and the World Cup was in November. Um, so obviously there's a lot more time for individual players to prepare. Um, you know, someone like Gloria, who when I first met her and when you meet her in the documentary, she was still at school. I literally went to her school to interview her. Um, she is now finished school, um, but she's sort of training twice a day um, in the gym. There is a gym in Garoka. Um, there's actually a national sports institute in Garoka, which probably doesn't look a lot like what you guys have in Loughborough, but it's the National Sports Institute and there's a gym that national players like Garoka can access. Um, so individual players' own preparations are really focused. There's a larger pool of yeah. players now um, because more talent has been identified. Um, so everyone's everyone's really excited. Um, and, you know, for those players who have been there since 2017, a lot of that initial nerves about playing on that kind of world stage, traveling overseas, um, will have gone. I mean, none of the players have been to England. Um, I, can, I can say that with almost certainty. Um, so that will be a whole other challenge. Um, the weather will also be a yeah, challenge. Yeah, time that um, is definitely Everyone's very excited. And I think everyone also, well, not everyone, but some of the key players, some of the more senior players who've been following very closely, you know, on social media, um, what's happening with the World Cup, you know, the draw, um, Prince Harry, all that kind of thing. And, and the, 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 I think they will realise that, that this World Cup is going to be so brilliant for the women. Um, what's being provided for the women is um, next level. Um, and we had a taste of that at the Nines World Cup in Sydney last year, where um, male and female players um, were paid equally for that tournament. And so that's also um, both encouraging for the players, but also I think that helps back in PNG for the public to view women's rugby league more yeah. seriously. Because um, you know, I often say that you can have you can have as much media coverage as you want as women's sport, but it's really sports themselves that lead the way um, on how their women's code is perceived. Um, and I'm very excited about the next World Cup for that reason, and, and we've already sort of started to see the beginnings of it. I think you're 100 percent right in in saying that, and the World Cup nines, the equal participation fee, and the rugby league World Cup. I think we've got to be really proud as a as a nation of at the minute of how the, John Dutton and his team at the Rugby League World Cup uh, are conducting themselves. The draw was next level. They've launched a mental health charter. And the fact that it's wheelchair women's and men's all on the same platform, it's going to be absolutely amazing. So you've got a thing for World Cups, the 2008 World Cup, the 2017 World Cup, 2021, will you be coming back to Leeds? Are we going to be, are we going to be graced by your presence? Oh, absolutely. You missed that 2013, which I was also at. That was obviously in England. Um, I spent many weeks i was actually trying to think today how many weeks it was but at least seven kind of traveling around england and that one of course also included france which was fun covering that tournament um mostly covering the pacific nations in fact um i was on uh, bbc5 live quite a bit with um dave woods and his colleagues um did a bit of work for the host broadcast with andrew voss who is brilliant and he loves png and he also loves power mary he came to one of our screenings and made such a beautiful speech um so that was how i got to know Vossi. um so yeah, every World Cup's been very different for me. 2008 was having just moved to Australia um, and covering it a little bit, but also having a few beers on the way. 2013 was uh, pretty much all about the coverage for about five media platforms at the same time, um, sometimes. And 2017, I was the media manager for the Commons and the Orchids and made Power Mary, which was also a lot of things to be doing at once, um, but an amazing experience, you know, being based in PNG for most of that World Cup, um, sort of as the Commons were playing their pool matches and as the Orchids were preparing before they left. Um, it was just the most amazing time, um, probably the the best thing I've done in rugby league to be part of that World Cup pool, pool matches in PNG. Um, and, you know, it was actually quite funny because um, anyone who's watched previous rugby league World Cups in England will have seen, you know, the Commons come over and get thrashed by the likes of Wales on a freezing night in Bridge End. And this time the likes of Wales got thrashed by the Cornwalls on a steamy afternoon in Port Moresby. And there was a lot of joy about that. Um, so it was a really um, interesting reflection of how international rugby league has changed. And um, I guess one of the acid tests will be how, how those Pacific teams um, do perform uh, next winter, autumn, but it'll be pretty <laughs> wintry um, in England. 
and I will definitely be there and I can't wait and I can't wait this time will include the women's oh business. brilliant well we, we can't wait to have you back in Leeds um as you said you, you know you, you kind of have, have strong roots in Leeds and Leeds Rhinos fan um and obviously a lot of the women's competitions are going to be played at um, Emerald Head Unless so you won't have seen the stadium in its new glory will you no because the last time I went to Henningley was actually just by coincidence it was in um it was the last game before the South Stand came down, yeah. I think. Or it was the last season before the South Stand came down and it was the last game that I went to. It was a summer evening. It was one of those beautiful Leeds summer evenings when it was still light at 10 to 10 p.m. Um, and that was the last time I went to Emerald Henley. So I am... Well, it, 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 it's different. class. It looks really, really good. And again, again, I'm, you know, obviously mentioned my, I, my career cut short by injury, but the opportunity to, for all those nations to play at what is undoubtedly the best rugby league stadium I think um in in the country I'm gonna I'm gonna say obviously biased as a Leeds last but um it is amazing and I was just thinking when you were speaking about you know the journey that you've been on with with PNG and the Orchids um the opportunity to come up against Brazil in their their first ever World Cup I was really lucky that I went to Brazil in December met the women's team met the guys who were really full on and I didn't know whether because you said that obviously after Power Mary um was launched a lot of the women who watched it then realized that there was an orchids team and then started playing and and there's a guy called rob rob bergen who he is for latin heat and he's kind of on this a similar sort of journey do you do you know rob do you share sort of stories and talk to me about that absolutely yes um you know rob bergen is one of um i would say one of one of the heroes of, of rugby league one of the most important and influential people in the national rugby league because People in England probably don't realise he pretty much has single-handedly introduced rugby league to an entire yeah. continent, um, which is South America, and some of it's actually Central America. So perhaps you could call that a couple of continents. Um, but he has, for a long time, was kind of on a one-man mission. Now he's got some great people around him, uh, but he has been so influential in identifying, um, you know, potential markets for rugby league, and because of the part of the world that he's working, as you mentioned. Um, it is also there about um, the social change aspect as well. So I was actually messaging Rob this week about something that I'd seen in Brazil um, that I thought could be an opportunity for the women's team there to get involved with, sort of similar to some of the bigger social aims with Power Mary. But there's a lot of um, common opportunities to use um, sport in general, but rugby league in particular, um, to get more involved in social change, which brings new partners on board. Um, for example, I said one of the biggest funders of Power Mary was the US Embassy, and they've now sort of become much more involved in funding the NRL's Voice Against Violence program in PNG. Um, so, in a lot of these um, newer countries for rugby league, I think um, not only is social change a big opportunity, but women's rugby league is actually the biggest opportunity. Um, and I hope there will be countries that we're going to over the next few years where we go first with women's rugby league because that is where there's a gap, women's sport is a big gap in a lot of countries, especially in Asia. Um, and not only can we can we offer the greatest game, but we can also offer a lot of social impact through our sport. 100% the greatest game. And honestly, the, the, the size of Brazil, not shocked me because I knew how big it was and, and the impact that um, Rob and um, Paul Grundy and Hugo, um, for for us has been doing so Hugo basically is based in Brazil and he's doing all the work and Rob and Paul are helping with the coaching and the commercial side and stuff like that and it, absolutely amazing the the distance that the teams are traveling when I went to their national championships just was absolutely incredible I think some of them have been on a coach for sort of like six to eight hours to to get there and 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 they had to be there early so I, it was just honestly so bizarre but I think they're going to have a great um, journey within the 2021 World Cup. And I, I saw some glimpses of, of greatness from individual athletes. And I think that tweak a few things and, and they'll be really, really good. And I think they'll bring the same passion as 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 the PNG Orchids did because you come back to there's nothing better than the opportunity to create a little bit of history. And, and that's what they've got. So it's great that you're speaking to Rob. And um, I just think that next year is going to be so, so exciting. And, and hopefully it can be as powerful and um, as passionate as, the Orchid's journey was um, in, in 2017. And I think the, the the last thing to finish with, unless there's anything that you want to you wanna speak about, is we spoke about the documentary so much. I can't recommend it enough. I think it's absolutely brilliant. Um, so 
you give on the opportunity to tell people how to access your award winning documentary at the moment. Oh, thank you. Well, at the moment, everyone in mean, most countries in the world are stuck at home, um, but you can still access Pat and Mary. Um, first of all, you can buy the DVD. I've got one here to show you. This one's actually signed by Neely Cook. Um, you can buy the DVD from our website. Um, or if you don't have a DVD player, because you know in 2020 we're never too sure what people have, you can even buy it on a flash drive if that's more appropriate. Um, we're also really encouraging people to host screenings of it, despite the fact that most of us are in a lockdown. Um, so we're having virtual screenings. We had a great one last week with a university here in Australia where um, basically the film was made available for 12 hours on a certain day. Um, so people could watch it on their own time on that day, but then um, there was a sort of discussion um, about it and sort of social media conversation about it. And so a lot of people who hadn't seen it saw it in that way. Um, so we're still totally encouraging um, rugby league clubs, especially a club that right now their players can't see each other, they're feeling a bit disconnected. Um, they could host a screen on a certain day, get all the team members to watch it in their own homes and then um, get on a video call and talk about it or something like that. So. At this time when we're all a bit disconnected, um, especially in women's rugby league, um, which is something I've been sort of working to try and address a bit, something like Pam Mary can bring people together, um, bring a bit of perspective and remind us all what we've got to look forward to when everything. 100%, 100%. And, and I can't wait, like I say, for 2021. So a massive thank you for, for catching up today. And I think we've spoke about how inspirational all the, the, the players were and, and what they've done for their community, what they've done for PNG. We probably haven't mentioned what, you, what you've done, Joanna, and your passion and your vision has really, really helped the women who have been part of that documentary. So thank you for, for what you did. And I'm sure that the women will always hold that dear to them. And honestly, it's absolutely outstanding. So... Thank you very much. Thank you for catching up. And I look forward to seeing you at next autumn, like you say. Absolutely. Can't wait. And can't wait for the PNG girls to get to come to England, see the birthplace of rugby league um, and to catch up with, with you and all the other England players again. Because definitely England women have been a very big part of the Orchids journey, the first World Cup match, the tour last year. I mean, to think that England women came on a rugby league tour to PNG is something that even two years before we could never have dreamt of. And it's already happened. So um, I think... But we're, we're very well connected through Women's Rugby League and that will only continue. 100%. Well, good luck to you and wish all the best for the, the PNG Orchids preparations ahead of 2021. And we'll look forward to seeing you all then. And thank you very much. There's only three common denominators in this country. One is God. Two, Tok Bishin Mibla, Tok Toke. Three is Rugby League. It's called Rugby League. I've been my dentist. The only nation in the world with Rugby League as their national sport. The United Nations Human Rights Commission says Papua New Guinea is failing in its duty to protect women. In our culture, ladies are always treated uh, second to men. <laughs> A national women's rugby league team is being formed. They'll be known as the PNG Orchids. Two months to get a team ready for a World Cup is, is not a lot of time. We know how to play rugby league, let's do it. Just playing together for a few months, if we can put up a good fight against some team that's played for years, it says in itself how far we can go. We will prove that women in this country are as strong as men. No, my mother go play I'm so proud to you know, represent my country. This nation's about to change, and women are starting to come through and empowering each other. So the line is like nowhere. And when we go play rugby, we're making history. Here. You girls know how to win a game. We just haven't been doing it. We fight till the end. 
Can Papua New Guinea do the impossible? They have got nothing, girls. We are in this game. The little things in between. Okay, they're the things that win games. It's not a bad one. Oh, fumbled by him. A chance here for the audience. Yeah, experience. It's the dream of me who come through here.